think most people have done that because there isn't any sound interference. Mm -hmm. Second of all, if you go to the top of your screen, you can switch to active speaker video and it should be at the top of the screen of, so that the, the long tab of um, video images, if you go to the top one of those and go to the um, left hand side, just along from the left hand side, you'll see a rectangle. If you click that, that will ensure that whoever is speaking appears on your screen. I hope that made sense. And if not, please feel free to put a question on the chat function. Um, but also feel free to play around with the system. Um, we're all on a bit of a learning curve with Zoom. And part of the reason for today was really to give you some experience of it. As we go along, if you have questions, the easiest way to, to send them through will be via the chat function, which is on the toolbar at the bottom. Okay, you said it's okay. So whoever's just dialed in, if you could select the mute function, that's in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, that will mean that there isn't sound interference from your side. The chat function is on the bottom toolbar, you'll see a speech bubble. If you click on that, feel free to send questions through via chat, which we can deal with at the end. You'll also see on the slide in front of you, a Slido um, uh, web address. Uh, so there's another method of sending questions through, which is via Slido. My suggestion would be that while we're in the session, the chat function is the best way to uh, send your questions. Welcome to anyone who's joined. Could I ask that you do hit the mute function on the bottom toolbar of your screen and it's the left hand side, the microphone icon. If you could hit that please, that will ensure that there isn't any sound interference coming through from your side. I think we've got someone from Sheffield City Council who's just joined. Um, could you just hit the mute function, please? It's on the bottom of your screen on the left hand side. And that means that any sound interference from your side won't come through. I think you've done it. Thank you very much. So um, also, either during or after the session, if you could, um, if you have any topics that you'd like us to do further sessions on, please feel free to either put them in the chat function or to send them through to us uh, by email after the session. And we'd also welcome feedback. Um, before I start the session, I just want to introduce my, myself. As I've already said, my name is Anissa Niaz Dickinson. I'm an employment lawyer who haven't met me. Um, I think like everybody else on this, um, who signed into this seminar, my week changed dr dramatically uh, due to coronavirus and specifically due to the tribunal's decision to not hold in-person hearings from Monday of this week. And so, uh, although I should have been in Cardiff, doing a multi-day hearing. I have instead been doing telephone hearings um, and been catching up on drafting various pieces of work, including a response to EAT um, grounds of appeal. So uh, despite the coronavirus, life goes on. And um, as with all of you, I have work to, to get on with. I'm going to hand you over to Rosie to introduce herself uh, before we get started. Hi everybody and um, welcome to my home office otherwise known as my dining room and um, I hope you're all acclimatizing well to working from home more than just on the odd day and um, it certainly starts um, off very strange I guess when it becomes more the norm to work at home than to be in the office but I'm sure we'll all be used to it before too long. 
after a week of in-person hearings last week uh, in East London and Liverpool, this week has seen me doing different things too. Like Anissa, I've been doing telephone hearings and, and also advising on the, um, the employee retention scheme and producing a huge witness statement for a claimant in a five-day case listed to start later on this year. So slight change of focus for me, I suppose, again, less of the hearings, more of the paperwork and other advisory type work, but certainly keeping me busy. Thank you, Rosie. I, I now hand you over to Laura, who I think might have dipped out then, but no, we've got no, her back I'm now. Here. Oh, right. Apologies, Laura. I couldn't see you and assumed that your connection had dropped out. So over to Laura, who's going to introduce herself. Uh, thanks very much, Anissa. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody, from my home to yours. Um, we're demonstrating some of the difficulties of Zoom here and some of the things to get used to. So hopefully once the tribunal might start using it, um, we'll be a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and for keeping us company. I think um, this is the sort of thing that we may want to keep using into the future to make it easier for us all to stay connected face to face. And it's certainly as someone who's been isolated for a couple of weeks, it's um, uh, very nice to have uh, all your company. Um, whilst I've been isolated, I've had some very mild symptoms. Um, I have still been working. And just as the other two have said, my work obviously changed to telephone case management hearings and then work that's led on from that um, which we'll go into some chat about in a bit more detail um, such as drafting correspondence for solicitors who've been too busy to be able to deal with the litigants themselves um, drafting submissions for a video hearing that i've got in a sports disciplinary matter next week and drafting submissions for a judicial assessment which is the first time i've ever recommended um, and had agreement to go forward with one of those um, just a reminder for anyone that's just joined, if you could just mute um, your, vid uh, your microphone by the bottom left hand corner uh, on this page. Um, that catches you up with what we've been up to. And so I'll hand you back to Anissa to crack on with the uh, slideshow. Thanks very much. Thank you, Laura. So obviously what's kind of kicked all of this off for us as employment lawyers was the presidential guidance on the 18th of March which now I have to say feels like a lifetime ago, um, <laughs> even though it was only 10 days ago. Um, as we all know, that was a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There certainly was an element of, for a few days there, leading up to the presidential guidance, of wondering what the tribunal was going to do about the situation, as clearly counsel, solicitors, witnesses, and all parties were pitching up at the moment trying to do hearings. Um, and, and in the, um, this current context of lockdown, I do find it quite difficult to, to believe that I was in the Reading Employment Tribunal only last Thursday doing a full, uh, a full day remedy hearing. Um, but we did get that presidential guidance on the a little bit slow to digest uh, by the employment tribunals we found. Um, now, it was issued under Rule 7, which is the rule which allows the tribunal to consider resources and securing, as fo so far as practicable, speedy and efficient disposal of proceedings. Um, I was just about to remind everyone if you could just select the mute function on the bottom of your screens, um, that, that would be great. Um, I think the entire spirit of the presidential guidance is really focused on the overriding objective, as so many of our hearings do come back to the overriding objective, um, and that need to deal with cases fairly and justly. And what the presidential guidance does is remind parties of their responsibility to assist the ET to further that overriding objective. So the question really for all of us, I think the $64 million question is, how is COVID-19 going to affect the ET? 
as we're aware, the current situation is that in-person hearings are not going to take place until at least the 29th of June 2020. And Laura's going to say a little bit more about that later on. In the meantime, it's incumbent on the Employment Tribunal to take into account the impact of the pandemic when assessing what steps to take. I suppose the question is, what's going to happen between now and the 29th of June 2020? Is there going to be a build-up of, of cases waiting to be relisted? Or can we be getting on with some work in the meantime via alternative means? And so the presidential guidance specifically refers to electronic methods to conduct hearings, which, which might be, um, feel very new and almost groundbreaking, but it is currently in the ET rules. Laura's going to say a little bit more about Rule 46 shortly, but the methods that are specifically referred to in the presidential guidance are Skype for business, video conferencing, which is Zoom, uh, i.e. What, what you're all on today, and telephone hearings. Um, in terms of Skype for Business, I certainly haven't heard any employment judges mention Skype for Business. I suspect a number of employment judges haven't even heard of it. In terms of Zoom, as I'll come on to later, employment judges do seem to be referring to Zoom. Hence today's session to give you an opportunity to try it out um, and, and see how it functions. And finally, telephone hearings. We've all been carrying out telephone hearings for many, many years now. They're, they're not a new thing to the Employment Tribunal. But the question really is, how far can we go with telephone hearings? Um, how far is, is the tribunal willing to interpret the rules in a way that allows telephone hearings to be used? on uh, substantive hearings. Before I hand you over to Laura for the next slide, could I just ask um, the lady from Sheffield City Council to mute her, um, to mute the sound on her laptop. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see on the left hand side on the toolbar a mute function. Great, I think that's going to cut out the sound going forward. I'm going to hand you over to Laura now to talk a little bit about Rule 46. Um, thanks very much, Anissa. Just before I do, I've got a couple of points to add on from what Anissa's just said based on the updates I'm getting through my business and property work. I think it certainly feels with the information we're getting from the courts rather than the tribunals, that they're potentially a bit further ahead of the curve um, perhaps have more facilities available to them and it does seem that certainly in the courts the legacy system that they have is Skype for Business. Now the problem with that is if you haven't downloaded it already um, and I had so I haven't encountered this problem but because it's a legacy system apparently you can't create a new account uh, because it's now been transitioned over to Microsoft Teams. So it may be that you want to download Microsoft Teams and start using that if you're talking with other people, um, say internally or doing conferences, again, just to get to grips with a new scheme. Um, different courts are taking different approaches, but I think that can give us an insight as to where we might end up. And for example, in some courts, they are saying that hearings up to 30 minutes are automatically going to be listed by telephone and hearings for between 30 minutes and two hours, unless there's a good reason not to, are going to be automatically heard by video. Now that's not happening straight away because obviously there are technological difficulties that will come on to that are needing to be addressed. Um, but I could see that happening in the tribunal as well. And I know people are already saying video conferencing that could be telephone uh, a telephone conference is a new meeting that could be an email. So I think there's a bit of a line drawn there by the courts to say, well, we don't need to do everything by video and uh, get into the smartest part of our house to be uh, filmed for every hearing. 
But as you can see on the slide in front of you at the moment, um, there is provision already in the 2013 Employment Tribunal rules to be able to hold hearings by video. I, I believe there was some consideration that there might need to be a change in the rules. And um, personally, I can't see it from what's written here. I, I can see the issues with the practicalities of putting this into place. But as you can see there, Rule 46 allows for hearings by electronic communications. Well, that must be what we're doing now, provided that the tribunal considers it's just and equitable. And the parties and members of the public, that's probably the biggest issue, are able to see and hear what the tribunal sees and hears. And any witness can be seen by the tribunal. Now, the first part clearly causes difficulties for how are we going to be able to include the public in video hearings? Well, as you can see here, we've currently got 69 people on this Zoom call. Um, I know there's a lot of encouragement, albeit I'm sure there are procurement issues, but a lot of encouragement for the tribunal to use Zoom. And one could envisage that with public hearings, they could, a list could be placed online and the Zoom dial-in details could be placed there with an instruction, as uh, Anissa has been saying, to put your microphone on mute um, and an instruction that you're not allowed to record it because that's what I'm doing at the moment um, in order that we can uh, disseminate this round. Obviously, you can't do that in the tribunal. So I don't know if Microsoft Teams or Skype for Business can do that. I would imagine they can. Um, but hopefully that's a way around that problem. The second problem was the tribunal being able to see any witness. Um, obviously, when someone is being cross-examined, we all know it's not just what they say, it's how they say it, how they look when they're saying it, when they're pausing to think about their answer, are they flicking through the papers? Do they look like they're deep in thought? Um, really in a positive way or a negative way floundering for an answer. You can tell when you see that. Um, and so that part of the rule does seem to stymie any hearing that would need uh, cross-examination to be held by telephone. So perhaps that's what the tribunal was thinking about a need for a change for rules. But I think we can all see the difficulties of witness handling by telephone and why that's probably not ideal. Um, so are these matters going to present insurmountable difficulties? Um, in the long run, we would hope not. Um, I've already put with some ideas there and I'm okay with technology, but I'm not the best. Um, I, I certainly uh, can get by and I'm sure there are brighter minds than mine with these sorts of procurement issues uh, considering these matters. But of course, it's come upon us very quickly and for everybody all at the same time. So looking at the further constraints, um, overlaps with some of the points I've already been saying and really I think what hits our jurisdiction harder than many of the others is the number of litigants in person that we deal with, uh, the number of litigants in person with mental health issues and the number of litigants in person with financial difficulties. Understandably, many of them have lost their jobs if they're involved with people like us. And so we can't hear, as perhaps people could in um, maybe some of the business and property court issues, but even there, not so much, um, work on the basis that someone has a fully functioning Wi-Fi uh, capability, that they have um, video calling either on their phone or on their mobile, or that they can afford, depending on the internet package that they're on, to stay online for more than a few minutes if they've got data limits. Um, so that's one of the first things once we do finally get to video conferencing for tribunal hearings that you'll have to be exploring either with your own clients if they're dialing in from home or with uh, the other side. Uh, staffing levels in the tribunal are also um, issues that have been identified in the presidential guidance. Um, as we'll come on to explain in more detail and as Anissa has already alluded to, some judges are not taking it upon themselves, but making their own suggestions for using the likes of Zoom. Um, but notices of hearing are still going to be, need to be sent out with those details, with hearings being set up, licenses being obtained. So for those that don't know, you can sign up to a Zoom account for free yourself. But if you want to be able to talk to, uh, I think it's more than two participants, or it might be you plus two, 
for longer than 40 minutes, you need to buy a license. Now it's only about £12 a month or £100 for the year, um, but I can say only when that's a business expense. Um, for other people, um, that's not uh, so easy to achieve. And certainly if we're relying on the tribunal to get enough licenses, that's more administration that needs to be put in place. Uh, conversion of documents. Well, again, um, I have colleagues that practice, for example, in personal injury that can't believe the way we deal with papers last minute at hearings, the way they're brought along, included. Um, a lot of effort will need to be put in to make sure that hearings are prepared for in advance and that the judge really does have all the documents they need. As you can see here, you can share your screen. That's what Rosie's doing at the moment to run this PowerPoint for you all. So if there was one document, say an email, I would hope the tribunal would be pragmatic and sympathetic and allow us just to pop that up on the screen and email over a copy. But if you have a claimant sending lots of handwritten documents, as can happen, um, you can't expect them to be scanning it in from home or going down to the local post office. Um, and it's something that I think we will have to grapple with. And it may be that efforts have to be made to do as much as possible online. So any of your skeleton staff that are in the office and scanning things aren't put under too much pressure. Um, if we're then doing deliveries, well, it probably doesn't help if you're delivering things straight to the tribunal. That takes us back to point two, issues of staffing levels. But if I was an employment judge, I wouldn't be keen to share my address either. Now, it may be that the tribunal could liaise with couriers that you're sending out, but again, we can all see there where problems could go wrong, uh, problems could arise. Um, and I can understand why the tribunal don't want to be receiving things in hard copy, not just for staffing, but because we know the virus can last on uh, certain surfaces. So I think that's something to think about very early on. And the previous methods of saying to claimants, well, we'll just put in all your disputed documents at the back of the bundle, probably isn't going to cut it any longer um, for the purposes of sending large PDFs and for the purposes of the tribunal being able to use them um, and move around the documents. Requirement to be heard in public, I've already addressed that. And obviously, if it was a Rule 50 hearing with privacy and restrictions, or a restrictive reporting order, depending on the level, it could either be that it's not shown or no dial-in details are given, or the further warning that matters can't be reported, even if the hearing can be observed, could be included on the um, list, uh, the, the, uh, the list of hearings that would be published. But suitability of the hearing. Um, we may be being optimistic and suggesting that this can happen, uh, hearings via video. I don't think so. I think if we start by trying, with the likes of out of time hearings, uh, whether someone's a disabled person, those sorts of half day, one day hearings that involve witness handling and move up through the gears to perhaps two, three day hearings. I think it can happen in the right case. It's obviously going to be easier where both parties are represented. And there are obviously, I'm sure you're all thinking of now, your ongoing cases where this wouldn't be suitable. But in my view, we need to give this a try as soon as we possibly can because whilst we do have the 29th of June as a return to work date we don't know if that's going to be definite and actually there are some uh, modernization points some development points here that could be useful um, save your clients costs if you don't have to send me to Cardiff Tribunal for a three-hour uh, disputed time point if it could be done by video uh, even after we're returning to work, hopefully as soon as possible in the summer. So there's some of the issues we're facing. Um, and there's some of the issues that we're talking to judges about when we're doing telephone hearings to um, try and encourage a move towards adopting video hearings and trying to be pragmatic and problem solve to make sure that we're not just pushing everything off into the long grass because we all know how terribly busy we've been anyway. And we can all see, again, the problems that this is going to create when we do get back to work with having hearings held in a timely manner. Um, so I think having identified some of those problems, Rosie's going to talk to you about the reality of where we're at now. Thanks, Laura. So, okay, we're a week in and of course, all of, all 
all case management preliminary hearings have been converted to or were already going to be telephone hearings. That's standard having a case management preliminary hearing by phone. What we've got to bear in mind though is that historically we wouldn't be doing telephone case management preliminary hearings where we had a litigant in person or a person represented by a non-professional representative. So the scope widened. What does that mean? Well, that means that the case management agenda is all the more important. It may well be that you aren't able to agree the case management agenda, but certainly if you're able to at attempt to agree a case management agenda and more crucially send whatever you have got to the employment tribunal in advance, I think that's something that's obviously really, really important at this point in time. I think we can also expect to hear the employment judges on case management preliminary hearings providing more help and more guidance to litigants in person and um, rather like you would expect in an in-person case management preliminary hearing because for litigants in person this has got to be a more daunting or an as daunting process for them they can't see the judge they can't see the other person who they're talking to over the phone and it, it makes it all the more difficult so i think that's that's the only real difference in your ordinary case management preliminary hearings being converted to phone. Now, of course, that wasn't the only impact of um, the presidential guidance. The key one was the changing of all substantive hearings, which were already listed um, up to the 26th of June, being converted on day for day one into a telephone case management preliminary hearing. And these telephone case management preliminary hearings generally are not the same as what you would ordinarily expect. Some of them are, in our experience, some of them have been very, very different. And we're going to give you a bit more of a steer on that. And it, in terms of what's been going on this week, it seems that the majority are looking at four key areas. First one being, is the case that we're talking about fully prepared? Have all the case management orders been complied with? And, and are, are we essentially ready to go? If this had hear, hearing had gone ahead in person, would it be ready? Where it's not, the employment judges are going to be looking at, first of all, why not? And, and second of all, what they can do in the meantime, in terms of case management orders, to get the case ready to be heard. Once that's been established, we're looking at relisting. So two things there relisting is it does it need to be in person and re and if so relisting when alternatively relisting is it suitable for and for, for being relisted and having a hearing by electronic communication so by video or by telephone now it may well be that the case is entirely non-suitable for a video hearing in which case you're probably looking at a relisting some point towards the end of this year or at some point next year in reality. However, as Laura and Anise have already said, the tribunals are looking at video hearings. They are looking at ways which, which, in which they can be used to keep things going. And I think it's really important that we are all looking at our cases and thinking whether or not the case as it is, is suitable for video hearing, or in fact, whether or not it's possible to hive anything off from the substantive case in order to hear perhaps elements of the case and narrow whatever is left to be a future. For example, it may well be that you had a substantive five day hearing listed, which was going to deal with everything in one go, but in actual fact, there were preliminary issues such as disability, such as jurisdictional points and out of time, which could be hived off and dealt with earlier and dealt with by video conferencing. So the judges are going to be looking at things like that as well. The fourth topic, I suppose, in terms of where employment judges are looking to see what can be done to progress cases is in terms of resolution. Can we get rid of some cases at this point in time? Can they be settled? And how can the employment tribunal assist with that? Of course, we've all heard of judicial mediation and judicial assessment, as Laura's alluded to before. Judicial assessment hasn't commonly been something that people have been keen to pick up, but it may well be that we're seeing that more and more in the coming weeks and via telephone and via video. Similarly, judicial mediation, the employment judges are looking at whether or not they too can be dealt with via video or by telephone. And not only that, but they're looking at widening the scope. 
previously it was it was ordained that only hearings which were more than three day or three or more days would be suitable for a judicial mediation taking into account the overriding objective proportionality tribunal time etc it certainly seems to be the case that judicial mediation is seeming to be opened up to cases which may not be ones that are going to last for three days if it means that it looks like the case might well be resolved so what's actually been happening in our experience this week these are the locations where we've been having de dealings with the employment tribunal through telephone hearings and i can pick off a couple from there so my manchester hearing this week was in relation to what was a two-day hearing which was being converted to a case management telephone hearing and it pretty much followed the path which i've just described so is the case ready in our in our situation yes the case was ready all the case management orders bar one preparation of a list of issues had been complied with an order was made for a list of issues to be agreed when was the case to be relisted well this case is to be relisted in september at the beginning of september was it suitable for electronic means well actually yes we thought it could be dealt with by video conferencing if by September, we're still in a place where in-person hearings are not taking place. And, it, and the parties and the employment judge suggested that that be revisited um, through correspondence in August. Finally, um, resolution, this wasn't a case, although the employment judge was willing to look at judicial assessment and judicial mediation, it wasn't a case where the parties thought that they, that would be appropriate in the circumstances. Contrast that with a case in, Midland, in the Midlands West Employment Tribunal. This was a case where it was going to be a case management preliminary hearing in person, but was converted to a telephone case management preliminary hearing. And then, whilst on the case management preliminary hearing, was converted into a judicial mediation. So I think what we need to learn from that is that we need to be prepared for anything on these converted cases, because we may well just end up having converted cases dealt with as mediations or as judicial assessments straight off. Fortunately, the parties were in that case able to, via the medium of judicial mediation, actually find a resolution and that case was settled. So it was a really positive outcome and some very proactive working by the parties and by the employment judge. Anissa, what's your experience been? Apologies, I was on mute. Um, so in terms of the locations, I can speak to London Central. Um, I had a telephone pre-hearing that was listed as an in-person uh, pre-hearing on Monday, uh, but instead was converted to telephone. Um, and that in, did involve a claimant in person. So it's precisely the type of pre-hearing that Rosie just mentioned, i.e. one that would normally be dealt with in person so that the employment judge can hold the claimant's hand um, through the hearing and explain to them the process. So this hearing went ahead. It was a very long hearing. It, was, it took two hours. Um, it was a frustrating hearing, but as different in person. Um, and the reason for that was really that the claimant uh, wasn't accepting that the hearing was not about the substantive issues and only about case management. We've all had those types of hearings before, so this was no different over the telephone. What was interesting about it, however, is that um, they, the employment judge listed a pre-hearing on jurisdiction to take place, interestingly enough, and coincidentally, on the 29th of June. And he took the view that that could, in his opinion, be dealt with via Zoom. So this would be a full day hearing on jurisdiction that would involve some cross-examination of the claimant. Um, and the judge thought it would be entirely possible, even though there is there are contentious issues to deal with, to deal with that um, and, and have that hearing um, 
via the Zoom platform. And in order to make that happen, a number of orders have been made in the case for the agreement of a bundle, for that to be sent to the claimant in good time, and for um, my side to submit a skeleton argument. And indeed, as the hearing approaches, there may be additional case management that's required. But because that hearing will deal with jurisdiction, um, and that relates to both of the claims, so the first question being, is the claimant or was the claimant an employee therefore does he have jurisdiction to bring a claim for unfair dismissal um, and and or was the claimant a worker therefore does he have does the tribunal have jurisdiction to deal with his claim of whistleblowing so the intention is for that hearing to be dealt with via zoom um, the other hearing that i've dealt with this week was in cardiff that was a converted telephone hearing relating to a substantive full hearing that was due to take place this week. Um, in that case, Cardiff didn't seem to be perhaps quite as progressive as London Central. The aim was very much to relist the hearing. Um, however, the judge did start to moot the possibility of some sort of electronic um uh, method of dealing with the claim now both sides in that case were of the view that that it wouldn't be appropriate it's it's a four-day hearing um, and even the employment judge at london central took the view that zoom might be appropriate for one day hearings i suspect the reality is that the tribunal is going to have to get used to this before it gets a little bit more adventurous and starts to use it on multi-day hearings. Um, and so in Cardiff, there were issues about relisting, but the judge did mention judicial assessment and judicial mediation, although the view was taken that neither were appropriate for various reasons. There were also then applications that were made because let's not forget, these hearings are in lieu of substantive hearings that have been listed and often that might present opportunities so i suggested to my instructing solicitor that this was an opportunity for us to make an application to serve an additional witness statement uh, and we all know that those last minute applications don't go down well but in this instance the judge was very sympathetic i explained to him that there was a witness that we couldn't call for the hearing this week because he's no longer employed and uh, because he was going to be out of the country but that nevertheless that was a crucial witness and one that we that would assist the tribunal with with dealing with matters going forward and so the tribunal has taken a sympathetic view to that application i think laura also has some experiences to share um, yes, uh, apologies if I take these a little bit quickly, but we're getting a number of questions in, so I want to make sure we get through those as well. Um, I've had a real mixed bag of experiences, both in terms of hearings that have gone ahead and hearings that haven't. And this is only within the last week from last Thursday. Um, last Thursday, I had a hearing against um, a good local solicitor, um, which obviously makes life easier but we had a number of contentious issues that needed to be addressed. The judge seemed to be using a new telephone system for the first time. I think perhaps it was new to her dialing in from home. And at one point we needed to take a brief break to sort some matters out um, from the judge's side. And so I called my oppo and we just managed to fly through the issues, having got a view at that point, as hopefully we're giving you, um, albeit uh, different judges do take different approaches, but once we gathered the judge's approach, we saw the writing on the wall of where we were going, what we were going to be able to get sorted, what we weren't, what needed to be put in writing, an application to amend that he was going to make orally, etc. And when the judge came back on the call, 
um, us having been on there for a good, I think, 45 minutes or so already, we were able to say to her, well, this is everything we think you ought to do. And it made life a lot easier. So I think pragmatism is, is front and centre and trying to get things agreed um, where ordinarily you might think, oh, well, you know, we'll see what happens or let's see what the judge has got to say that's fine but if you can give us the scope to say this is what we want but use your judgment um, that's really helpful because it is a very fluid situation at the moment i had another hearing where we we're expecting a claimant to attend from romania albeit we weren't sure they were going to attend that obviously went out the window when we were converted and we found it was a poor telephone line speaking to the partner who's the representative on the telephone and what we've done there is actually that's one where we've opted for judicial assessment it's a situation where we feel the claimant is wanting to clear his name well they've told us as much um, and obviously that's not the right forum it's not what's going to happen we were ready for a trial we had all the we had the bundle together it's not huge it's a few hundred pages uh, witness statements of the usual suspects investigating officer disciplinary appeal officer and the judge has given us provision within seven days to send in written submissions um, and so we feel that um, that's a, a suitable approach in this case and the judge is hoping to get a decision out to us as soon as possible obviously obviously it'll be non-binding um, it's the sort of thing that we can turn around fairly quickly from working from home we're used to these sorts of last minute changes um, and it at least does something in the interim. Uh, we've listed a final hearing anyway, but this is Midlands West and we've listed it for March next year. So that gives you an idea of, of where they're getting to, perhaps not as flexible as Manchester, but it was also a five day case. Um, I've had another one that's been listed for judicial mediation to take place either by telephone or video, depending where we're up to at that stage. We're looking to get it listed in June, but the judge couldn't get on the phone to listing and get through whilst we were on the call. Um, but what she did there was instead of putting it off for a consideration by the regional employment judge or listing it for a judicial mediation preliminary hearing, we went through straight away what was going to be needed, position statement schedules, counter schedules, and had a discussion of perhaps the more detailed focus that would need to be to make the mediation, particularly if it's by telephone, more manageable. Now, as some of you may have seen me say in the chat function, members of our chambers have conducted judicial mediations by video this week. Um, I'd invite you to follow a chap called Kevin Latham, that's Kevin Latham, L-A-T-H-A-M, who is one of our cost specialists, and he's given a breakdown on Twitter as to how that went uh, what the successes were, what the challenges were, um, but it certainly seems to have been very manageable. And so I think the tribunal is seeing that's an area where we can start to move to video at quite an early stage. And there are all sorts of functions in, I must admit, I can't remember if he was on Zoom or uh, Microsoft Business, but I think it was Zoom, uh, it, it says on Twitter, where you can break out and so have your own private screen. For example, if some of you will have have sent me messages and I've replied privately on chat. So you can have your own private breakout uh, to talk to your clients and take instructions before you go back into the main room. They were then WhatsApping the mediator to say when they wanted the mediator to log back in. Um, so there are all sorts of ways that you can make it work with the technology we've all got sat around us at the moment. Um, I have, and this answers, I think, um, I think it was your question, Heather. Um, I have had a hearing which was due to take place yesterday pulled because the claimant wrote and said I've got childcare difficulties, I've um, got issues with my health, I can't go ahead with this and the tribunal pulled it straight away. Um, we wrote back and explained in very clear terms why we needed this case still to be case managed and the tribunal have changed their mind and are looking to list it for a telephone hearing now. I don't think that they will keep doing that for a long period of time. I've actually now got the same tribunal had a similar application in another case and they've come to us and said, what do you think? Rather than just pulling it straight away. And I think, as I said earlier, things will start to settle down. It's the speed with which all of this has happened is leading to an awful loss of plate spinning, 
and getting used to these new technologies very quickly. And I think perhaps when an application comes in of someone saying they can't go ahead with it, people have, you know, the tribunal have taken that as an opportunity to say, right, okay, get that one off the books. And that's no criticism of them. But if you are having that happen, don't be afraid to apply, whether you call it a reconsideration or not, and explain why a hearing needs, needs to take place. Certainly the tribunal reacted very quickly to us when we raised that as an issue. Um, one of the reasons a claimant has not wanted a hearing to go ahead is because they've not understood what a telephone hearing is, because as was mentioned earlier, they don't normally do them. Um, so I think being aware of that, having a look in what the claimant is saying, is that what their concern is, and allaying their concerns yourself and explaining that's your understanding to the tribunal can help to keep these hearings on track. Um, so quite a quite a varied approach. I've not had anything where it's just been an automatic case of, oh, nothing's happening, we're just going to list this. Um, so I may talk a little bit about that um, in answer to some of the questions as well. Um, we've just put up on the screen there ways which you can keep up to date and keep in touch with us. Um, many of you will have our direct contact details. We just ask that if you're sending us an email, CC Paul into it to make sure that we're keeping on top of everything because as I'm sure you are, we're getting an awful lot more emails than we have done in the past. Um, Chambers has a blog which you can see there at the top of the page called Law in the Time of Corona. Um, we've been writing for that blog, but so have our colleagues. So for example, if you're looking for um, some background and update info on furloughs, Rosie's dealt with that, but you can also read about the law of frustration from Mark Harper, Queen's Council. So have a look at that. There are some subjects from other departments, which I think will really help feed into what we're dealing with in the tribunal and in employment civil actions. Um, you can also keep up to date with us on our employment Twitter feed and on the wider King's Chambers Twitter feed. And we've got the contact details set out there for Paul. Um, I'm not sure if we sent out this PowerPoint already, but we will be sending it out after this uh, seminar. Um, the email that this came out on uh, did tell you what we can do to help you. We, we are diversifying. As I said before, I've been writing correspondence for solicitors where I might not already. Um, so do think about how we can help you. Um, we're very flexible and we're here to work as a team as we always are to make sure that we all get through this together. Um, as we said earlier, do let us know of any other topics you want us to cover. We will be having a seminar in the same slot next week, 1pm Friday, where it will be myself, Rosie and Rosie interviewing Steve Flynn, who some of you may know joined us about 18 months ago now. He's an employment specialist, but very much um, a sports lawyer. And because of that, he has a lot of experience in arbitrations. And we've been talking for a while now about how we can use arbitrations to resolve employment disputes. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about next week. These are hearings that people sign up to as being binding, and they are very modern. They are extremely experienced in arbitrations with dealing with hearings by video. They are ahead of the curve. It's something that we've been using already in the sports field, which is something that myself and Rosie are involved in as well. Um, and we'll talk you through how that might be able to help with the backlog that we can just see from this chat um, is going to be coming very fast at us in the employment tribunal. Um, we're also going to be looking at talking about furlough, uh, statutory sick pay, uh, potentially the impacts uh, on or, or the uh, employment rights or otherwise of volunteers who signed up under the new NHS scheme. Uh, but anything else you want us to cover, then let us know. Okay, so moving on to the questions, um, I'll be leading you through the questions and identifying people to answer them. If there are any more that you want to follow up on, again, do that in the chat function and I'll be keeping my eye on it there. So first question came through the Slido website. Um, it's an anonymous question which says, um, I would appreciate your views on workers who have been told to attend work but do not wish to for fear of catching, a coronavirus, of catching the coronavirus, but they do not have symptoms. So um, Anissa, what do you think there? Reasonable management instruction issue perhaps? Yes, so... Um... I think it's understandable at the moment that employees may not wish to attend work. Um, there would need to be some discussion with the 
I didn't hear whether it was worker or employee, but with the person involved as to why that is. Um, the government guidance obviously refers to social distancing. So if there are issues around social distancing and the employee perhaps feeling that they're not being kept safe in the workplace, then there may be uh, matters for the employer to consider as to why that employee doesn't wish to come to work. Um, and, and going back to that question of reasonable management instruction, is it a reasonable in management instruction to expect the employee to work? Now, if the social distancing uh, recommendations uh, can be followed in the workplace, then potentially yes. But if not, then potentially no. And that employee might have a reasonable argument to say that it's not a reasonable management instruction because they're not being kept safe in the workplace. Obviously, we're in very new territory, but I, I do, uh, in my view, issues of safety and following the government guidance would have to be carefully considered. Okay, next question again has come through Slido anonymously. Um, Rosie, do you think that tribunals will expect parties to have complied with all case management orders in advance of the converted telephone hearings? Okay, so bearing in mind that the telephone converted telephone hearings are supposed to be um, replacing the actual substantive hearing that was supposed to take place, I think that the um, employment tribunals are going to be expecting that the uh, case management orders have been complied with. It's not often the situation anymore where you get case management orders, for example, to exchange witness statements, which are only a matter of days before the hearing. So uh, in my view, employment tribunals are going to be expecting the parties, unless they've got very good reason not to have complied with case management orders, to have complied with them. Um, I think that um, it may well be the case that there are difficulties, for example, if there are witnesses who are unable to complete witness statements because they're unwell, or if there are um, difficulties in agreeing things like chronologies, and there may be some leeway, but I would expect employment judges will not just simply think that it's okay for everybody to down tools and just wait to see what happens at, a tele at the telephone case management hearing. And um, just to add to what Anissa was saying in relation to the last question around um, whether or not it would be a reasonable management instruction in those circumstances, I think we need to bear in mind as well the mental health issues that some people have. Um, if somebody's got a particular mental health problem in relation to anxiety, for example, relating to health, um, it may well be that there are reasonable adjustments which are required in order to address the point that was raised if they they are saying that they're too concerned to come to work because of, they might catch coronavirus. So I think that discrimination, disability discrimination risk is something that needs to be factored in there too. Um. Okay, um, next question. Um, so I'm just gonna put two together. I've got one from P. Del Monaco and one from Carl Atkinson, both asking for views about judicial mediation. Um, obviously I've touched upon this already and I've just checked um, Kevin Latham's Twitter and it was Zoom that he was using um, for uh, a mediation. Um, it was a what? What? Ooh. Am I still here? Yep. Fantastic. Sorry, everything just disappeared then. Sorry, it was just me turning the share screen off. Oh, good grief. Okay, thanks, Rosie. Um, <laughs> now we know what happens when you do that. Um, it I'm was. Glad you didn't swear then, Laura. Yes. I thought you were oh um, More learning points for Zoom. Um, so it was Zoom that Kev used um, for the cost mediation, and he was against cost counsel in London, clients and solicitors in different places. And I think this probably answers some of the questions that have been asked um, about how this will best work, as he um, talks about there having used breakout rooms, breakout functions. Um, apparently you can create another room to go to. So you and your client can be sat in different places, but can go and talk to each other. So whilst that's a concern that's been raised, um, I don't think actually um, it's going to be a problem once we learn how to use all of this. Um, so that's uh, one way to go ahead with this. 
And if I just for one moment uh, just go back to my questions list. Sorry. Laura, just... there was a question on chat that I didn't deal with um, at it, the it's time. It's okay, uh, Anita, I've got the list back here. So just okay. double checking uh, what happened, uh, what the questions were about mediation. So confidential lines and social distancing, it sounds like this can happen. What I would suggest people do is give it a practice like we did yesterday. I'm not suggesting we're seamless today, but we're doing a much better job than we were in working out all the different functions that can be used. Um, so try um, with yourself uh, and say a couple of colleagues to have all of you in one meeting, two of you go off into another meeting to make sure you feel comfortable making it confidential. Um, and I think it's something that once we've practiced and now we're having experience of, we will certainly be pushing it, selling it, however you want to call it, to the tribunal to encourage them to do the same and to use Zoom for those sorts of matters to make sure that we've got the greatest functionality to allow for a he fair hearing um, or a fair mediation. Um, next question was from Heather Atkinson. Um, she said that um, during my short hearing, uh, PHRCMD that took place on is taking place on Monday against a litigant in person. It's been pulled rather than going ahead. Well, I've explained my experiences already that that has happened, but we've been able to get it back into place. Um, but I think Paul Clark is saying that actually we are finding that is happening also um, in tribunals. But as I've said already, don't be afraid to challenge it. Um, next question from Molly Horton. She's asked if we have any intel on what's happening at London Central. In her hearing yesterday, it didn't happen. There was no communication from the tribunal other than an automated response um, saying that hearings are postponed. And that's obviously what we've seen in the Daniel Barnes update. Um, I don't know, ladies, if either of you have had a different experience or, or know any more. I'm afraid I don't. I think from the hearing that I did earlier this week, I did certainly get the impression that there were staffing issues down at London Central, as I think there will be across the tribunals. So um, my, I suspect that if hearings are being pulled at the last minute for no apparent reason, that that is probably due, at least significantly due, to staffing rather than any policy decision. Um, I did get the impression that London Central is um it has a number of staffing issues the judge mentioned it um and in fact the judge had to uh, leave the call to go and try to find various documents um that he needed because he said there just wasn't anyone to send those to him he had to try and find them on the system so i wonder if london central is closed uh, to all hearings until monday due to staffing, but I guess we'll know further on Monday really as to whether at least the telephone hearings can resume. I think that's some of the difficulties that we face in the tribunal. I don't know if it extends into the courts, but um, they do use a lot of agency staff um, for funding reasons. Um, and at this time, obviously we want people who are experienced and know what they're doing. And we want other those people to be able to train new people up so we can see the knock on effects there. Um, next question, Louise Martin has asked, in the example Anissa was discussing regarding the hearing on jurisdiction, what steps did the tribunal take to understand whether the claimant had the requisite technology to undertake a Zoom hearing? Anissa? Um, quite simply, the employment judge asked the claimant whether he had access to a laptop and an internet connection. So that was it. Um, it was very much so he um, admitted to that, like me, he had only um, even heard of Zoom this week uh, because he asked me um, whether I knew about Zoom. And I said, yes, sir. But literally, I admit, only heard of it this week. And he said it was the same for him. So just those two things, Laura. Did he have a laptop? Did he have an internet connection? Okay, and then finally, Justine Dawson has asked whether we have any tips on how best to prepare remotely for a judicial assessment in the current situation. I haven't done one before, but feel that some of my cases may suit assessment rather than mediation. Um, Rosie, have you got any views on that? Um, 
I'm not entirely sure. I suppose tips to prepare remotely, I think it's basically to know the case so that you're ready to be able to address points which, um, which, which, which may crop up. I mean, it sounds like an obvious one, really. Um, and I guess as well, it's making sure that you've got the documentation organised. So making sure the documentation is sent over in advance, exchanged by both parties, including some perhaps skeleton submissions. Um, I suppose it's essentially making the job as easy for the employment judge as possible because they're the person who's going to have to try to get to grips with things relatively quickly and to reach a conclusion. Um, it has its pros and cons. I know that you've been preparing for one, haven't you, Laura? So you might be able to give some more tips. Yeah, I think I have been thinking about this, both in terms of preparing for the judicial assessment, but also for preparing for my video hearing in my sports case next week. Um, there, my submissions are being sent to a panel and uh, only one of them is likely to be legally qualified. And I've thought, I, I found some overlapping points here. Normally, I would write a skeleton argument rather than written submissions. But it strikes me where you are losing some of the control of the situation compared to what you're used to, whether that's because it's by video or whether it's because it's the judge taking a view on the papers, um, you need to think about explaining your story in the way that you might want to do it if you were face to face. So talking the judge or the panel through the necessary points um, in perhaps more detail, almost writing their decision for them. Now, we always say that's what a skeleton argument should do, but we always add to it orally. So with the written submissions, I think taking the judge through it step by step in the order in which she would write the decision. So looking at what are the allegations, um, what are the facts, what's the law, applying the facts to the law in more detail than you would normally do, I think is a good idea. Um, absolutely making sure the bundle is clear. If you can tab the bundle, I use um, PDF Expert and you can put bookmarks in there. So the judge will be able to jump to the key documents by clicking on those as sort of hyperlinks you're making it so much easier for the judge then. And of course, we know that helps to get them on side when you make their life easier. So I think preparing the bundle like that, really trying to thin it out. And if you can't, prepare your own reading list. Um, so don't just uh, rely on what's in the witness statements. Have it all in one place for the judge to, to see what's your reading list, what's necessary. It also helps to give them an idea of time. Um, that's another point that, that I've considered. Um, I think they're the main, the main ways in which I've differed from how I would normally uh, prepare a case that I was going to go and speak to orally. I probably have included more law than I normally would, but in a way that sets out more quotes from, for example, the regulations in the sports case to make sure, again, everything is clear and in front of them and they haven't got to flip through the document uh, to find things. I've also included a section called submissions on the documents and I've just gone through them in page order, highlighted the page number in bold, underlined what I'm titling the document to be, and then just a couple of sentences of why I say that is relevant. That's what I'd normally do in witness handling or would do orally, but it just helps to set the picture whether before I speak to someone or whether for the judge um, to get across everything that I want in the most user-friendly manner. Um, and of course, I would also say, involve counsel, we can certainly help you with your advocacy there um, if you need us at all. So there are some of the points that, that I would pick out. Um, we've just had another question from Charlie Bradbury um, which Anita's responded to in chat, but I'll see if um, Rosie's got anything else she wants to add. So Charlie's asked, many of our hearings require a translator. How do you think the tribunal will deal with this? Um, Rosie, what do you reckon? I, I perhaps am slightly more skeptical than Anita. I suspect that may be a bridge too far for a lot of employment judges. Um, my experience of dealing with in-person tribunals with interpreters um, means it's an additional challenge in person. Um, I'm sure that there is the technology out there in terms of use of private rooms, like you said, 
um, earlier in relation to mediations, Laura, where an interpreter and um, the individual who requires the interpreter could have a chat between themselves to try to understand things, but I'm struggling to see how that might be able to be accommodated in, in terms of um, timing. So obviously an in, uh, a tribunal which involves an interpreter generally takes longer in the first instance and so by video conference as well it, it might be um, considered maybe to be disproportionate in terms of time. I don't know, um, maybe Anissa's right and, and I'm being unduly pessimistic. Um, I, th I think Rosie because I, I suspect I know the case that Charlie's talking about <laughs> And it's one that I was supposed to do, if I'm not mistaken, the week after next in Croydon. So the evidence is will be fairly brief. It will be a fairly short cross-examination. And what I was envisaging is that perhaps an interpreter could dial into Zoom, having had a separate conversation with the claimant over the phone, the interpreter could dial into Zoom claimant speaks and then interpreter interprets but I agree with you also um, it obviously would be an additional uh, challenge and I suppose it's these are going to be baby steps I think we all need to recognize that the very fact that a judge mentioned Zoom to me this week I thought was quite encouraging but there are going to be very slow baby steps towards using this platform for the shortest and simplest, most straightforward hearings going forward. And then once there's some confidence, maybe a little bit more. So I think, Charlie, that probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. But who knows, you know, by this time next year, if, um, heaven forbid, we end up in this situation again, maybe then when there's that confidence there. Um, I, I've actually had a couple more queries come in, one by Slido and one on chat. So just looking at the Slido query, um, we're asked, what issues do you envisage with internet breaking off and remote hearings from a fair trial perspective and also potential cost implications? Um, I think everybody has just got to try and do their best. I think we need to be realistic about what we can achieve and we need to ask claimants to be realistic about that as well. Um, I think they are being. Um, I doubt many, I've not come across many who are overstating their technological capabilities. Instead, I found more it's people not wanting to go ahead with hearings. Um, but as we've tried to do here, we're trying to speak more slowly, making sure we're being clear and taking your time. So getting used to this forum. Um, I've had uh, the signal from Anissa go a bit squiffy a couple of times but because we'd practice that I know that it will catch up and I will be able to hear what she's said with just a slight delay of a second or so so not jumping on top of each other straight away to say oh are you still there etc um, it's something that we all just get used to by using this forum um, if it drops out completely and a hearing can't go ahead I think that's a new added litigation risk that we'll have to advise people of I'm aware of colleagues who've been on BT Connect calls with the civil courts and they've been kicked out of the hearing for uh, capacity reasons, it seems, and they've not been able to get back in. Um, I don't think we're in a situation where we can charge that to BT at the moment because everybody is trying to do their best. And I think it's just something that we're going to have to get used to. The internet service providers and the likes of Zoom are getting used to it capacity wise. So what I would hope is that things will only improve from here. But I think you need to be asking the right questions of self represented parties, or maybe your witnesses, for example, if they're dialing in from home, to make sure that they've tested their internet connection to do a trial run with them having a video conference. So they are comfortable with the process. And you know, they haven't got inappropriate posters behind them or anything like that. Um, to make sure that your witnesses are prepared for the hearing in this new format. Um, and just finally, um, we'll make this the last one because apologies, we've run over a little bit here. Um, on the chat function, um, we've been asked, um, I have a hearing where my client has an auditory processing disorder. Does anyone have any experience with those disabilities? Um, and I suppose the question is, what can we be doing here? I think that's a situation where it's best to ask the client. 
um, what they need and what uh, sort of steps they would ordinarily take, whether that's to speak on the telephone or to speak by video. Um, if it's auditory processing, um, I would imagine that putting a lot more in writing in advance and doing a hearing by video rather than telephone would seem to be the most appropriate way. Um, but as we've discussed before, not every hearing is going to be suitable for technological uh, steps. Um, Anita, I don't know if you've had experience of people with auditory processing disorder. I think I might have, yeah, not in the very recent past, um, but certainly over the past few years. Um, I suspect that could present difficulties for a Zoom hearing. Um, but I agree with Laura that it really would be one to discuss with the client. Um, it may be that um, a Zoom hearing may be less daunting. You know, it, I, you just don't know how that's going to be. Um, uh, you don't know what your client might think of the suggestion. I certainly would um, say that giving your client a trial run on Zoom to start with, um, if, if that becomes an option in your case, would be a very good idea. Um, giving them, a, inviting them to a Zoom meeting um, and having a Zoom conference with them so they can, they can see how it works in practice and then to take instructions really as to whether they are comfortable with using Zoom for the hearing. So I suppose we're going to have to treat it as, uh, as we would any reasonable adjustment um, and any hearing that we might discuss with the claimant where we ask them what reasonable adjustments they would like to have made. So the idea would be get, have a Zoom call with them and then ask them if that's something that's workable for them. Are there any reasonable adjustments that could be introduced to make that an option for them in order to deal with the hearing? Or are they willing to wait as long as it might take for an in-person hearing? I suppose with all of these issues, it's really just about balancing. It's about balancing what the current capabilities are with probably a very, very long postponement. Okay, um, Rosie, would you like to make some closing remarks for us? Um, well, what I'd like to say is thank you to both Laura and Anissa and to everybody who has joined the call today. I hope it's been of use to you all, um, even if it's only just to see our faces um, instead of being alone in your homes and um, isolated. Um, I found it very useful, certainly, um, and hopeful. Um, in terms of us being able to find a way through the current situation to ensure that you, we can continue to get your cases heard and the employment tribunals don't become overwhelmed with um, so many postponements. Um, but really, just remains to say thank you to you all for, um, for dialing in. Thank you all very much. Stay safe and hopefully we'll see you at one o'clock next Friday to talk about arbitrations. Thanks very much. Bye now. <laughs>